the Priory Ballam, a strange, unquiet place. There was a murder in this house, a murder that rocked Victorian society. A murder, moreover, that was never solved. Mrs. Bravo, I need anything more tonight? That'll be all, thank you, Marianne. Good night. Good night. Hot water! Hot water! Get some hot water, for God's sake! Mrs. Cox, you better come. The master's ill. Charles Bravo, a bridegroom of only five months, was dead. The cause was antimony, a poison that literally burns away the organs of the victim, ghastly death. Behind him, he left a young wife and an impenetrable mystery, which this inquest did little to resolve. Order. We find that Charles Delaunay Turner Bravo did not commit suicide that he did not meet his death by misadventure, that he was willfully murdered by the administration of Tata Emetic, but there is not sufficient evidence to fix the guilt upon any person or persons. <laughs> The revelations of life at the Priory had made the inquest the scandal of the age, and no wonder. It had the lot. Jealousy, money, sex in bucket loads, motives without number, hijinks in high society, just what the British love best. And at the centre of the storm, the reluctant star on whom the nation's eyes were fixed, was the beautiful, if tarnished, Florence Bravo. So who did kill Charles Bravo on that terrible night? Well, one thing we do know. By any standards, it was a most mysterious murder. arrived in the leafy and fashionable suburb of Balham five years earlier, five years before those ghastly events, it had all been so different. She'd been full of hope, full of beans. Of course, she was a woman alone and she'd had her troubles, but she felt that she'd put them behind her, that this was a new beginning. That has to go into the dining room, and for heaven's sake, be careful. Marianne, that goes into the drawing room. Campbell was the favourite daughter of an Australian millionaire. She came to England as a child and she grew up here, at Busket Park in Oxfordshire, one of England's great houses. In 1864, at the age of 19, Florence married Alexander Ricardo. She'd cracked it. She was inside the charmed circle of the aristocracy. Alas, her handsome prince proved a violent alcoholic, and before long he was whacking his young bride around the room. In 1871, Ricardo died suddenly in a hotel room in Cologne. He'd forgotten to change his will, and as his widow, Florence inherited everything. Overnight, she was rich and she was independent. It's good to see you settled, my dear. I am my own woman at last. Can you believe it, James? I feel like a bird set free from a cage. You'll be happy here. Country setting, within easy reach of the city, what could be better? Well, I'm quite sure I shall never be bored. 
Would you like a tour of the house? I'm quite proud of it, I assure you. And I feel in need of some praise. And you shall have it. Will you be all right on your own, Mrs. Cox? I'm a little tired, Dr. Gully. With your permission, I think I'll go to bed. Yes, of course. Though I must admit I'm so excited, I doubt I shall sleep at all tonight. No one has guests on our first night in a new home. You work for him up at Malvern. What's he like, this Dr. Gully? Well, he's a good doctor, no doubt about that. His clinic's world famous. Oh, famous? Really? What's he do that's so special, then? He treats rich people for their, uh, their nerves. Famous people? Like who? Ever heard of Florence Nightingale? Cowboy. Charles Dickens? <laughs> Blimey. And Mrs Ricardo, she went to see him, did she? Yeah, well, when she left her husband, she was a bag of nerves and no mistake. But he's cured her now, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. He's cured her good and proper. <laughs> <laughs> every rule in the book. He was 40 years older than her. He was married, although admittedly he was separated and his wife was in a lunatic asylum. Gully gave up his practice in Malvern, an enormous sacrifice because it was terribly successful, and moved to a house a few minutes walk away. Pathetic, really. What is? Uh, waiting for callers. No one will come. No one respectable, that is. Why not? Because someone caught them at it. Start naked in the parlour when we were in Surrey. She thinks I don't know, but I do. The lady's maid there told me. Oh, Mrs. Ricardo's finished. He might as well move in. Mary Ann Cuba, your dad. Well, why shouldn't he? He's got a key. What does she see in him? Imagine doing it with a man his age. Ooh, it turns his stomach. Mary Ann was telling the truth. During a house party in May 1872, the host came back from a walk unexpectedly to find Florence and Gully going at it, hammer and tongs, on the drawing room sofa. Well, after the Ricardo breakup, it was too much. The story whizzed round London, and from that minute, although she'd never quite accepted, Florence was finished in society. Her friends wouldn't receive her, and nor would her parents. And there was worse to come. Never far from Florence's side was Mrs. Cox, the lady's companion she'd hired in a sad bid for respectability. Jane Cox cuts a rather mysterious figure in all this. Born in Jamaica of mixed blood, by the time she met Florence she was a widow with three sons, and a failed attempt to open a school had left her with enormous debts. Florence was her saviour, and life at the Priory had rescued her from ruin. I've killed my baby. I've killed my baby, and now I have no one. That's not true. You have Dr. Gully. You have your parents. No, I don't. My mother won't even speak to me. She doesn't know you're ill. And if she did, if she knew why I was ill, do you really think she would speak to me then? Florence, my dear, you have your whole life ahead of you. 
I may have children, but who wants a widow with three sons? If I was as beautiful as you, as young as you, as free as you can be, I'd start again. And so will you. Really? When our society's turned its back on me? When no one respectable will even bid me good morning? Come, you know as well as I do what can change all that. What? Why, marriage, of course. The right marriage can wash away a multitude of sins. Dr. Gully, good morning. Mrs. Cox, how are you? I brought these for Florence. Is she in the drawing room? Mrs. Ricardo isn't receiving visitors today. She asked me to tell you she's feeling rather tired. I see. Well, then. <laughs> Whether he liked it or not, by ending the pregnancy, Please. Gully had altered the relationship. Give her these for me, will you? Had Florence ceased to love him? So I hope she feels better soon. I think not. But she yearned to go back into society, even at a modest level. Charles Bravo must have seemed like a passport to a better life. My friends accuse me of showing off in court. And do you? I prefer to think of it as a kind of persuasion. Or perhaps more of a seduction. But in a way, a lawyer does seduce his jury. A friend of my father said that once. Seduction, persuasion. How different are they? I'm quite sure you could persuade anyone to do anything you wanted, once you'd set your mind to it. You flatter me, Mrs. Ricardo. I'm quite sure I do not, Mr. Bravo. Charles was the adopted son of Joseph Bravo, a successful merchant and an old acquaintance of Mrs. Cox. But he was beneath Florence in social rank, and she wouldn't have entertained the notion if she hadn't by this time been tainted. Then again, can you blame her? Her first two lovers had been a drunk and a pensioner. Law is exhilarating, and it challenges me. But for a man who wants to make his mark, a career at the bar is devilishly slow. And you are impatient? I fear I am. So what will you do? Promise you won't make fun of me. I promise I'll make fun very gently. Someday I mean to stand for election. Now I've shocked you with my ambition. No. I like a man with ambition. And I am not so easily shocked. There is another reason why I won't let myself get stuck where I am. Tell me. It would take too long before I could offer anything to someone like you. One day I want to make a woman like you proud of me. You don't have to. But if I don't tell him and we do marry, I'll always be afraid he'll find out. He'll have a power over me. But surely if he knows, he'll have that power anyway. The truth is I can't tell him and I can't not tell him. But why the rush? You only met him a few weeks ago. You don't have to decide now. Yes, I do. Why? I want my life to begin again. I want to be able to laugh and, and move among decent people. I want to live again. Very well. But if I was you, I wouldn't tell him. My mother gave me this. She grew it from a cutting. You love plants, don't you? I do. And animals. <sighs> you keep a fine stable, Mrs. Ricardo. My father used to tease me that I would come back as a horse. Do you spend much time at Buscot? Not as much as I would wish. I am not welcome there. Oh. Mr. Bravo, yesterday you spoke of marriage. I know you weren't exactly proposing, but before you would feel obliged to say anything further, I... I feel there are some circumstances you ought to know. When I was younger, we... You see, my first husband was very difficult. Difficult? And perhaps for that reason, after we had separated, I became very close with someone who had been a friend of my family's. Dr. Gully? Yes. 
I know he's important to you. I'm afraid I allowed an intimacy to occur which was unwise. I found that I was carrying his child. I lost the baby. And the relationship is and has been for some time quite different. If you should still wish to marry me, I feel that you must do so only in the full knowledge of what has happened in my life. And now I will leave you to think over what I have said. What you have told me changes things as you knew it would. If we are to go forward now, there must be promises made. You will not see Dr. Gully again. Of course not. And no one else will know what you've told me. No, but Mrs. Cox took care of me when I was recovering. Do you believe she is discreet? Yes. I owe her my life. I trust her completely. Very well. Florence, I think I should tell you that I, too, have regrets. There is a woman in Maidenhead. She has a daughter. Your child? Yes, I support her. Do you still see them? Yes, but from now on, I won't. I've told you this to even things out between us. I'm conscious of the trust you've placed in me. But I believe that a woman who has gone wrong once is unlikely to go wrong again. And because you have shown such faith in me, I'm satisfied to make you my wife. Charles may sound generous, displaying a tolerance ahead of his time, but don't be deceived. In that moral climate, no man would have been able simply to set aside and adulterous liaison, illicit pregnancy. Florence's real attraction was her money. We will never refer to these distasteful subjects. For us, the slate is clean. Is that clear? It is. <laughs> I thought I'd come on the wrong day. I'm sorry to have kept you. James, I need to tell you something that will be painful. I have decided that we can no longer see each other. What? Mama is not well. You know my father won't allow her to come and visit me, and I am forbidden to go there. She is prevented even from writing to me until our relationship is finished. It is an absolute condition. I see. So I am to be cast aside? I'm sorry. Truly. Please try to understand. I think that you ought to have these back. And I would ask for the return of the letters and gifts I have sent you. And the key. I might have no right to speak. To what purpose? My mind is quite made up. My mother is getting old. I cannot make her suffer any more than she has suffered already for my conduct. If you love me... If I love you. If. Don't make this unpleasant for me. Unpleasant for you? I should hope it is unpleasant because it is torture to me. I have given you everything I have. By loving you, I have slipped from imminence to laughingstock. And now you throw me aside like an old shoe. It 
is better this way. Your lawyers told me that you invoked the Married Women's Property Act. Is this true? I take it then you believe I'm marrying you for your money? No. What other possible reason could there be? Oh, Charles, it does not seem so very terrible that I should choose to retain control of my own fortune. Does it not? And what of me? Am I to play lord and waiting to my heiress wife? No. I will not contemplate a marriage which doesn't make me master of my own house. Do you wish me to eat at a table or sit in a chair which doesn't belong to me? I tell you, Florence, unless it's settled, I cannot marry you. most Victorian men would have been incensed by Florence's decision to invoke the Married Women's Property Act. To start with, it was brand new. Less than two years earlier, her whole fortune would have passed to Charles automatically. Now she would hold on to it. And in those early years, the act was regarded much as we would think of a, a prenuptial agreement, an unpromising start to married life. No, Florence's decision was provocative, and it clearly indicates, well, to me anyway, that even at that stage, she didn't trust him. I didn't know who else to turn to. When is the wedding? December 7th. So soon? It is soon. Unless he carries out his threat to cancel everything. I'm sorry. It was cruel of me to ask you to help. I suppose it is hard to expect him to be a lodger in his own home. You think I should agree to it then? No, not entirely. Give him the lease on the house and the contents. Keep the capital in your own hands. He'll object, but he'll take it. If only I could understand the hurry. You haven't known him two months. Why not delay the wedding a little? Find out more about him. Test your own feelings. And then if you're sure... I don't think Charles believes in long engagements. No, by God, he believes in short ones. you'd gone. It's after ten o'clock. I wanted to say thank you for letting me be master here. If you are content, then so am I. You could make me happier still. I'd be glad to try. I think you should prove to me that you love me more than Gully. I don't know what you mean. I think you do. Please, we said we would never speak of Dr. Gully. Give me what you gave him. Uh, Charles, what are you thinking? What should I think? <laughs> you give yourself to an old married man, and not to me. How can I know I've chosen wisely? Can I help you, Mr. Bravo? I've left the horse in the yard. I'll see to him. What's that you're using? She's got a saw. It makes her coat shine. What is it? Antimony. I haven't heard of antimony being used for horses. Perhaps that's because you don't work with horses, sir. I've known horses all my life, and I know the properties of antimony. I used it when I worked for Dr. Gully in Malvern. So he taught you how to use it, did he? He understands how to treat horses, sir. It seems peculiar to rub a good horse down with poison. 
I've worked for Mrs. Ricardo ever since Dr. Gully left Malvern. She's never had any complaints about my work. We've decided that you must seek employment elsewhere. What? What do you mean? I don't understand. It's not very difficult. You're no longer wanted. Why? Look, if it's about the antimony... It's nothing to do with your poisons. You're clumsy man. You're a poor coachman. You're drunk and insolent. I'm never drunk at work. You ran the carriage into a milk cart last week. The milk cart ran into me! You have a fortnight's wages, which is more than you deserve. I'll have to leave my home and my wife is pregnant. Congratulations. We have two weeks. That'll be all. Damn him! And damn this miserable house! As for the wedding, she'll need a few stiff drinks before she goes to church. And he won't live four months after. You mark my words! What was Florence thinking? That her difficulties were solved? Just one week before her marriage to Charles and it already looked like she was exchanging one set of problems for another. There are going to be a few changes round here. Yes, you must be a bit worried. Why should I be? Well, brides don't much feel the need of a companion, do they? Always there. Thank you, buddy. Well, they're here. Here we are, home again. Oh, Jane, don't you look well? Have you had a nice rest away from all my fussing? I've missed you. Both. But the change has done you good. Oh, dear, Busket. It was so good to be home. This is your home. Charles loved it too, didn't he, dear? We were 20 at least for dinner every night. Very grand. <laughs> it was grand fun. We can be sure of that. And your cousin quite stole the show. Well, the best we had to put up with here was a new law on vivisection. <laughs> oh, I really can't bear to think about things like that. I suppose it's better than letting grave robbers hold medical research to ransom. Of course, if women ever get into medicine, then... What an appalling prospect. He's only jealous. He wanted to be a doctor too. I did not. You spend more time in my laboratory than any of your law lectures. I didn't know that, Charlie. I've always been interested in medicine. Florence, are you all right? Yes. Perfectly, thank you. Well, I think we'll go into the drawing room. Don't be too long over your brandy and scots. I'll stay as long as I want. We'll be with you directly. I hope Mrs. Bravo is really all right. She's as right as any woman in her condition. In her condition? My son and heir is on his way. At least we're almost sure he is. That's a very rapid development. Congratulations. You must come back in daylight. I want to show you around my little kingdom. We're spending too much in the stables. How do you mean, dearest? We don't need so many horses. We can do very well without the cart. I do not agree. We've dismissed Griffith. There's a saving already. In the garden, it's a ludicrous expense. Three gardeners and one would do. Charles, we have ten acres. We can't possibly manage with one gardener. My mother thinks we could manage with one. I said I thought perhaps two. And what has your mother to do with it? Have you been discussing our affairs with her? Why shouldn't I? She knows a good deal about running a house. As do I. And I will not take advice from a woman who did not attend my wedding and will not call it my home. One horse, one gardener. We want dress soon, I suppose. Oh, it's absurd. His father was always very careful with money. But I live within my income. I always have. I won't be told how to spend my own money, least of all by his mother. Mrs. Cox, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Bravo. I'll be with you in a moment, Jane. I'm sorry if I vexed you.
My darling wife. But Charlie, I am used to running things myself. You must allow me. Florence. <gasps> Florence, what is it? Get Jane. Get help. Please, hurry. We've lost the baby. I've got to make up the bed in the spare room for the master. What are we supposed to do about those? I'll leave them here and deal with them later. You know who's writing this is? Marianne, could I have some tea, please? Yes, Mom. No, I don't recognize it. Are you sure? Quite sure. What is it? Doesn't it say who it's from? It's from someone who says I only married you for your money. What? Read it yourself. Oh, this is awful. It's a vile, cowardly piece of work, and I know who wrote it. Who? Isn't it obvious? I reckon it's George Griffiths. You heard him when he was dismissed. You know what he's like. Well, Griffiths has got a temper on him, no doubt about that. And he's the sort to bear a grudge. I knew we hadn't heard the last of him. If Nibs thinks it's the doctor. Doctor Gully? He wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, I'm not saying he would or he wouldn't. When all said and done, he got there first, didn't he? And Mr Bravo doesn't like it. Anyway, whoever wrote the letter, it's quite true. We know who pays the pipe around here. And that's another thing his lordship doesn't like. Mrs. Cox will sleep in her own room tonight. I'll bid you good night, then. Good night, Jane. Please, Charles. It's too soon. I'm not ready. Sleep here if you must. Don't make such a fuss about everything! It's my fault I've been too patient with you. Now, come here. No. Charles, please. I'm not ready. I'm not ready! Charles, please! You know, I don't think Mrs. Cox is helping you, dearest. You seem more nervous than ever when she's with you. I need Jane. I don't know what I'd do without her. Then let's find out. My mother says if we release Mrs. Cox and get rid of the cobs, we'll save 400 pounds a year straight away. Perhaps in future, your mother would be kind enough to discuss her ideas with me. She's very busy. Once and for all, Charles, I have no intention of taking advice from a woman who will not call it my home. It seems you will do nothing to please me. What have I not done? You won't ask Dr. Gully to move away from here. I have asked him, and he has refused. We can't live in such proximity to a man who has known you as... I can't accept it. And I can't make him leave. So we are to be harassed indefinitely by your raging Romeo. I do not think it was James who wrote you that letter. Then you are either stupid or guilty, for there can be no third explanation. Charles! Charles! Charles, you will apologize to me for what you've just said. I will do no such thing. I will not allow you to... No! Looking back on the ten weeks of our marriage, ten weeks, what an indictment. I feel that many of my words to you were very harsh. As in her first marriage, Buscat provided her refuge, but Charles wanted her back, even though there wasn't a hint of apology in any of his letters for the physical abuse. But alas, with Gully gone, Florence had no protectors. And Robert Campbell, once so loving a father, wasn't prepared to see her go through a second public failure. He was deceiving himself. Florence was already a pariah. She had nothing to gain from continuing her dismal marriage. But he couldn't accept this, and nor could she. As they saw it, she had no choice but to go back. And Florence was pregnant again. But nothing had changed. Mrs. Cox, this is Gully's handwriting, isn't it? It's addressed to you. 
It may be Dr. Gullis. Open it. I'll open it later. I insist you open it before me. I believe it is a prescription for Jamaica fever. When did you see Gully? We met by chance at Ballon Railway Station. We were waiting for the same train. You spoke to him? Yes. What did you talk about? I said that I might have to visit my aunt in Jamaica, who is unwell, and that I might need a prescription. He said that he would send me one. Did you arrange the meeting? No. And that's all that was said? Mr. Bravo, you are not in a court of law now, and I am not under investigation. Please give me my letter. I don't want you to see him again. I don't want him anywhere near this house or anyone who lives in it. Do you understand? Have I made myself clear? That's Crystal. Another miscarriage, another blow to Florence's health, and the chance of ever bearing a living child receding, all of which must have made Charles's incessant demands intolerable. But as his own cousin Royce Bell once said, Charles Bravo was a man of very little sentiment. How is she sleeping? Not well. She's been very low since it happened. She can't seem to pick up this time. Even before the miscarriage, she was getting terrible headaches. She says her back is painful, too. She says she feels sick all the time, which she never used to before. What can we do, Doctor? I'll give it some thought. If I wanted to send something to you, how should I do it? Don't send it here. Where, then? My house in Notting Hill. I'll go there tomorrow. What did Roy say? Only that you're doing very well. And there's absolutely no reason why you wouldn't be able to bear a child. You just need some rest. Let me get you some more water. Ah, Mrs. Cox. How are the plans for your trip going? What trip? Her aunt in Jamaica is unwell. She's asked Mrs. Cox to visit her. Is this true, Jane? Are you leaving? I haven't decided yet. You must bring the boys round before you leave. I'll give them a game of tennis in the garden. Thank you. I'll just take my coat off. Florence said you were bringing her some masala. I'm going up anyway. I thought I could take it for you. How thoughtful. Mrs. Cox, has it ever occurred to you that Florence may be drinking too much wine? She's had a lot to put up with lately. I was talking to Royce the other day. He came to see her, you know. Yes? He was telling me there are ways of curbing a person's craving for alcohol. I thought I might talk to him about it. Do you think that's a good idea? I don't see what harm it would do. I know I can trust you not to say anything to Florence. I should hate to alarm her. Mrs. Cox gets 80 pounds a year. Are you sure? I'll bet it's not far short. And when you think, he got rid of George Griffiths and he did a real job. Mary Ann, don't have work to do. You better look sharp the way things are going around here. Don't you worry about me, Mr. Rowe. Not as long as Mrs. Cox is still here. Master's sick of her, and so he should be, sleeping with his wife, eating at his table. Everywhere he turns, there she is, watching and waiting like a great big spider. And I heard him say it's not up to him to pay for her sons. Get on with your work, Marianne. Just as you wish, Mrs Cox. <laughs> Sometimes I think I shall never be a mother. Of course you will, if you want to be. No, I don't think so. You're tired, my dear. It's made you melancholy. Do you ever wonder why I should be punished so? When I've done nothing wrong? Shh. Don't be silly. Have you thought any more about your trip to Jamaica? Not yet. If I do go, it won't be for so very long. What if Charles won't let you back? Oh, I'm frightened, Jane. 
I don't know what I'd do without you. Nonsense. You'll manage perfectly. <laughs> Nothing is perfect in this house. Where's my lovely wife? Here I am. I'm going to get changed. I feel like a ride. Is that your reading? Oh, dear. Ah, a holiday in Worthing. I don't see the point of it, my dear. Not when you're doing so well here. You look much more your old self already. In fact, why don't you stay up for dinner tonight? It would please me if you would. I'm really feeling quite tired. You will sit with me at dinner, damn you. Saddle Cremorne, would you, George? You best take the other one, sir. Cremorne's a bit frisky today. I said Saddle Cremorne. There'll be another place needed for dinner. Oh? The mistress is staying up. No, she isn't. She said she'll have a tray in her room. That was before he came home. Well, he's a fool. She fainted again this morning. There'll be no patter of tiny feet if she doesn't get her health back. Marianne, will you spare us your philosophy and lay another place at the table? I'm so sorry, the train was late. Did you have a successful day? I think so. I brought some details of one particular house I saw. It's on the edge of Worthing, very convenient. Jane, this is lovely, quite suitable. What do you think, Charles? I think you could recover perfectly well here. Charles had a riding accident today. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. It wasn't an accident. A horse bolted. I told you we should have got rid of it. It's not Cremorne's fault. Sell him or I'll have him put down. Did your bath help? My back still hurts, and I have a toothache. I'll fetch some laudan. If I want your help, I'll ask for it. This just arrived for you, sir. Who's it from? The governor. He's written me a shirty letter. Your father has? Damn it all, he's opened a letter meant for me. I'm sure it was a mistake. Will you kindly keep your opinions to yourself, Mrs. Cox? It's enough that my father and my wife give me no respect. You at least should know your place. Perhaps he just wants you to ask his advice more often. It's intolerable. First you and now my father. I don't know what you mean. I mean, Florence, that I will be master of my own affairs. You're not well. Why don't you go to bed? I'll go to bed when I want to and not before. Thank you, Marianne. You may go. You've already drunk a bottle of wine this evening and now you've sent for more. It'll help me sleep. I've asked Jane to stay with me tonight. I'm a little bit tired after my first day up. Very well. Have it your own way. I shouldn't wonder if you killed your baby with alcohol poisoning. Mrs. Bravo, I need anything more tonight. That'll be all, thank you, Marianne. Good night. Hot water. Give me some hot water, for God's sake! Row! Fetch a local doctor! I don't care who, just fetch him at once! Did you hear me, Row? Get a doctor. Mrs. Cox has sent for Dr. Harris. He's miles away. Get someone local, anyone. I don't care who, but hurry. And, and send to London for Dr. Royce Bell. Take it all to be washed. I want the bath emptied and fresh water in the jug. When did it happen? About 9.30. Charlie, can you hear me? <gasps> what have you taken, Charlie? He told me he had taken poison. When? Just before he passed out, he said, I've taken some of that poison. Don't tell Florence. <sighs> Mrs. Cox tells me you say you've taken poison. I don't remember telling anyone I took any poison. 
I can't believe this. Charlie would never commit suicide. I've known him since we were children. He wouldn't do that. I'd venture my soul. They say he's taken irritant poison and he won't live the night. Remember what George said? When? When they dismissed him. He said Mr Bravo wouldn't live four months after the wedding. He was all mouth, Mary Ann. It's going to come true, though, isn't it? Has a sample been taken of the vomit on the roof? No. Why not? We didn't think... Get someone to collect it now. With a clean silver spoon. It'll be needed for analysis. Of course. Uh, did he say anything to you? He said he had taken poison. But he didn't say what? What exactly did he say? I have taken poison. Don't tell Florence. You must tell us what you have taken. If you don't, someone could be accused of poisoning you. I'm aware of that. I've told the truth. It was only laudanum for toothache. If it wasn't, then so help me God, I don't know what it was. Sir William, please, there must be something you can do. I'm sorry. It wouldn't be right to give you any hope. Yes, Charlie. Could you read some prayers for me, please? Would you like to see the rector? No. All right. It's all right, Charlie. It's all right. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Charlie. He's gone. The police arrived, but there wasn't much experience of detection in those early years, and no doubt important clues were lost or overlooked. Where Florence had once sat alone, aching for company, now the world poured in to gape and stare, eager to witness the scene of a poisoning. An inquest established that the substance used was antimony. It had probably been put into Charles's water jug. Mrs Cox testified that he committed suicide, and the whole thing might have ended there, but for the Bravo family who insisted on a second inquest. The question was, who poisoned the water? Was it suicide, as Mrs Cox suggested? Or was it murder, as the nation believed? In essence, there were four candidates for the role of murderer. George Griffiths, the coachman, came in for some discomfort for two reasons. The first was because he did use antimony in his work. But the second, of course, was because he'd made that extraordinary statement about Charles not living above four months beyond the wedding. He was known to bear grudges, and I, for one, think that he was the author of the anonymous letter to Charles. But after he left the Priory, he found employment and a home for his wife with a certain Lady Prescott in Kent. They got on very well together, and she was even prepared to testify on his behalf if necessary. But he risked all that just to settle an old score. When Agatha Christie made a study of the case, she decided that the culprit was Dr. Gully. And certainly Gully had access to any poison. He also had a double motive. First, Charles had taken Florence away from him. And second, he was beating and abusing the woman Gully loved. Of course, to get the poison into Charles's water jug, he would need an accomplice, but he had one in Mrs. Cox. And the little bottle that he'd sent to her home in Notting Hill was never found. But when Gully met Florence for the last time, he advised her to give Bravo the house. If his jealousy was so great, would he have enabled the marriage? When at that moment he could probably have talked her out of it. Isn't that proof, really, that he'd come to terms with her decision? I'm not keeping this. James Gully was a kind, good man who devoted his life to helping others. 
but it seems to me to be quite against his nature to kill. As the case rumbled on, the London mob chose Mrs. Cox as chief suspect. Her name appeared in musical songs and jokes. Her silent manner, her shady past, all suggested the popular image of the poisoning murderess. It was on her word alone that the suicide theory rested, but was she lying? Perhaps because of this rising tide of hatred, in a simple act of self-preservation, Jane Cox decided to shift the spotlight away from herself and in so doing to throw her darling Florence to the wolves. In your statement to the police, you reported Mr. Bravo as saying, I have taken poison, don't tell Florence. That is what I said then. Then? Are you telling us these words are not true? No but I left something out. Mr. Bravo said, I have taken poison for Dr. Gully. Don't tell Florence. Why should he use that phrase, do you think? Mrs. Cox, will you tell the court just what was the relationship between Mrs. Bravo and Dr. Gully? The lurid secret was out. The affair, the pregnancy, the abortion, all of it. Victorian England was electrified. I refuse to answer any more questions about Dr. Gully. What has this to do with the death of my husband? What passed between you at Malvern, Mrs. Bravo? Am I not hurt and humiliated enough? Will you not be satisfied until I have been beaten into the ground like a dog? I appeal to the jury, to every man here, as gentlemen and as Britons, to save me from your cruel and irrelevant questions. Order! It was Order. an abominable misuse of a judicial inquiry. Now, we will move on to Dr. Gully's decision to follow you to Ballam. Mrs. Cox had played her cards well. The noose that seemed to tighten round her neck for a moment slipped away and she was forgotten in the greed for salacious detail. Could it have been Florence? No! Hadn't she suffered enough at his hands with his brutality and his incessant demands? By that stage, wasn't she aching to be rid of him? Very probably. But unlike many Victorian women, Florence wasn't trapped. She could have walked free. She had her own money. And her insistence on keeping control of it means that she envisaged a time when she might want to. And besides, she craved respectability. Would she have chosen to be notorious as the widow of a murder victim or a possible suspect? No. Florence was one of Fortune's victims. So was the mob right after all? Was Mrs. Cox really the villain of the piece? <coughs> she was alone with Charles for his supposed confession of suicide and she later gave three different accounts of it. By her own admission, she had the sheets washed and the water jug emptied. Surely she was trying to hide something. I want the bath emptied and fresh water in the jug. The problem is, Mrs. Cox had no motive. The most important thing in her life was her son's future. And at the time Charles died, security was within reach. She knew her old aunt in Jamaica was going to leave her a considerable estate, and it's inconceivable she would have done anything to risk that, least of all get caught up in a scandal. So if she didn't put the antimony in the jug, why the destruction of evidence? Why the altered testimony? Charlie, can you hear me? What have you taken, Charlie? When Mrs. Cox gave her first account of Charles's words to his cousin, she reported his speech as... I've taken some of that poison. I have taken some of that poison, which surely implies that they both knew the poison he was referring to. One theory is that Charles, worried by Florence's drinking, had been putting it in her wine in the hope it would deter her. It wasn't unknown. Antimony in small doses was sometimes used in this way by husbands and wives. Perhaps Mrs. Cox had caught Charles tampering with Florence's drink and accepted his explanation. I know I can trust you not to say anything to Florence. But of course Mrs. Cox changed her story to conceal that she knew about the poison. We find that Charles Delaunay Turner Bravo did not commit suicide, that he did not meet his death by misadventure, but he was willfully murdered by the administration of Tata Emeti. Order. But there is not sufficient evidence to fix the guilt on any person or persons. So what did happen? Who did kill Charles Bravo? Well, we know two things about Charles's death. 
He didn't show any surprise when told that he'd been poisoned, and he never demonstrated the smallest suspicion of anyone in the house. Hot water, hot water, get some hot water for God's sake! Why would Charles call for hot water if he didn't know what he'd swallowed? I think the fatal error was a simple one. I think he mistook antimony for Epsom salts. But although this theory fits most of the facts, there's something about it that doesn't quite add up. Why the denial of any knowledge of the substance when to reveal it might have helped. And after all, it was a clumsy way to try and stop Florence drinking, but it wasn't malicious. Or was it? I don't believe Charles was trying to save Florence from drink. We know that as a bride, she shone with health. Yet only five months later, she was an invalid. The headaches, the backaches, the miscarriages. These are symptoms of slow poisoning. Charles Bravo was trying to kill his wife. As Florence's heir, he stood to inherit over 60,000 pounds, a vast sum then. He was a man obsessed with money and he yearned to be master. And this is the only theory that makes sense of everything that happened. Think of the events on that last evening. The horse bolting, the angry letter from his father, his rage at the Worthing plan, and Florence's rejection of him. I'd say that he stormed into his bedroom and in his fury he snatched up the poison instead of the salts. Remember the flaring fire? I suggest that he flung the rest of the antimony into the flames to destroy the evidence. The irony can't have been quite lost on him. His careful plans for murder had resulted in his own death. And yet he had killed Florence after all. Killed her and those dear to her. The family was ruined, they soon left England forever. Gully lived on, but shunned by those who'd once honored him. While well, Florence didn't long survive the scandal. 18 months later, she was dead, alone and unlamented. She died of drink at the age of 33. The Priory is still standing. Shorn now of Florence's gardens and stables and fields, of course, but an impressive enough witness to the tragedy. The Bravo tale is a tangled one. And time's made a cloak of mystery around it that's hard to pull aside. But even so, of one thing I am certain. Charles Bravo killed Charles Bravo. <laughs>